Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the boardroom. As always, we are having chats, conversations, fireside chats with some of Malta's leading business minds. Some of you are watching us live right now, and we would love to bring you into the conversation. So please do add your comments and your questions below, and we'll pass them on to our interviewees for them to answer live. If you don't manage to catch us live, no problem. This will be streamed back on who's who.mt, Malta's leading business portal. Now, today's conversation is all about startups, a very important part of the economy. In October 2019, it was said that the global startup economy was worth nearly three, $3 trillion. And that was an increase of 20% in just two years. 20, yes, in just two years. Now, today on the show, we have uh, three experts working within the startup field. They are Simon Atsapardi, who's the president of Silicon Valletta. We have Leander Keith, co-founder and CEO of Secura. And we have Tony Atta who is the founder and director of Culture Venture. Welcome on the show, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Hello. Good afternoon. Hi. So we're going to jump straight in, Simon, with you. And I'm going to ask you, first of all, to define what a startup is. Sure. Um, so, I mean, the way I see a startup is it's a, a business, typically, not, but not necessarily uh, a new business that is either looking to solve um, a problem that has never been solved before or solve an existing problem in a different way, um, more efficiently or, or looking at the problem in a different, in a different light. Um, typically, for sort of the tech type startups, they tend to be focused on sort of high growth. So rather than trying to achieve profitability, it's trying to how do you f um, funnel as much resources as you possibly can um, into this business to grow it as fast as possible um, typically going through rounds of investments to eventually either end up with an exit or an IPO, where essentially you can come up, cash out from the from 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 the business. Um, obviously, you can see startups in a very different light. So you you have you know cultural type startups where the emphasis is not on the exit, but the emphasis on um, you know creating sustainability. Um, you have you know your charity type or your your sustainable type um, startups, which again have a different course. So it's not about having this big exit, but it's about you know how do we create new new ways of solving um, you know global problems uh, with uh, with regards to sustainability? Um, but the tech ones tend to be around big exits. Okay, and so is any new business? Can any new business coming into uh, the economy be classed as a startup in some ways, or are there very different categories? Yeah, like I mean, if you open up a um, a new hairdressers outlet retail, um, you're solving the problem in an exactly the same way. Um, it's not highly scalable, so you're not going to go from selling to 50 people to selling 3,000 people in, in, in two weeks. Um, so typically, when we classify startup, they use, there's an element of technology uh, which is given a lot of importance, but that's mostly because of its ability to scale. Um, so when we talk about startups, generally we talk about businesses that are high growth, so businesses that can scale up very quickly. Um, you know, sort of the, the, the Ubers of this world, the pipe drivers of this world, so these type of um, entities. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that uh, little brief insight there into exactly the topic that we're discussing today, Simon. So, Tony, coming over to you, obviously you are Culture Venture. You are an organization set up to primarily help those in the creative industries. Um, now, let's sort of go back three months to um, uh, when COVID hit and um, and sort of have a quick insight into into how cre the creative industries were hit by this well it was i think like most other industries a, a shock to the system um probably especially for those in the performing arts and other art sector probably was the first to shut down and will be the last to recover um so so you get a various degrees kind of 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 impacts of course on a local level um it impacted specifically those who are mainly self-employed uh, which ha they happen to be also those working across the sector, even across the globe, you know, these nano enterprises, the one one man band, so to speak. Um, and and of course, for the first time, um, some enterprises ended up in a situation whereby they actually experienced absolutely no income um and and couldn't so actually and it was really interesting even the survey i launched today that uh it also served on the other side the kind of a time for people to develop or renew their own business plans and their business model um and i'm really happy that artists and creative entrepreneurs have kind of acknowledged this 
as a need to, you know, we shouldn't have waited for COVID to renew our business model, you know, that, that should always be kept in check. Um, and, and now there is a sense of urgency also for a number of subsectors to restart and to reboot. Uh, and, and this, you know, today the news uh, has emerged even that, that uh, Cirque du Soleil has, has filed uh, for, for, for bankruptcy. Um, so, you know, such a huge organization laying off 3,500 people. Um, so even those that were considered to be successful creative enterprises have had their own structures collapse. Um, on the other hand, we do start uh, to see the emergence of new business models emerging, new arts organizations rethinking the way and also recovering and being resilient in all this. Probably this relates to how resilient they were before even COVID-19 or how, how the, their appetite to take risk, um, especially as, as Simon was saying, those who were you know, looking at providing solutions, thinking of new solutions, especially the crossover between the creative industries and technology, creative industries and education, creative industries and health, for example. Um, so, so, you know, th those lines are, are pretty, pretty blurred, but it's going to take a very long time for, for any form of full, full recovery, even in sectors like, like the film industry, for example. Okay, thanks, Tony. I'll come back to you in a bit to talk more about sort of the, the startups within the creative sector. And Leandra, I'll come to you um, now. You are running a startup at the yeah. moment. Mm -hmm. uh, Sakura is an organization that you have set up. Uh, you're currently sort of in the phase where you are seeking investment. Um, could you just talk to us a little bit about your journey and your experience as a startup owner, particularly around COVID? Uh, well, it's all been very um, vague. <laughs> uh, I said uh, beforehand that um, we're going through a phase where we're making big decisions on where and how we're going to develop, um, especially because at the moment investment isn't really, it's not something that's freely out there because investors don't have the capital at the moment to actually give to startups like ourselves. Um, so that's hit us quite hard. Um, I do have peers that have uh, managed to pivot their ideas to actually help their startup grow um, during this period, during this difficult period. Um, but it obviously, it depends on the startup. It depends on the startup ideas. It depends on the stage of the startup. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the company that you are sort of bringing to the market will hopefully eventually connect landlords with tenants. So you can imagine that that's something that's going to sort of come back, hopefully. Um, but, you yeah. know, with, with, with that in mind, a, a bit more on what you said about sort of investors not being around, maybe people would say, you know, why don't you get a bank loan? Why don't you why don't you sort of go down the traditional route? So maybe you could explain to us a little bit about what it is that startups really need from investment. Um, well, I think it's vital um, that startups um, acquire investment, acquire funding. Um, it's not all about the funding. Um, it's a lot about, obviously, the skills, the team, the drive. Um, but funding is a massive part of a startup actually succeeding. Um, and luckily we have places like you know silicon valletta and business angels malta now and people like organize organizations like this that are actually helping startups um gain that funding and develop their idea and you know succeed um going down the uh, the route of banks is i mean i think i can speak for everybody it's not it's not really the most practical and not the ideal route um yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. And and Simon, coming over to you now, why do we need startups in the economy? Why are they an important part of business? And critically, could we see them being heavily affected long term by COVID? Could we see less startups perhaps in two and three years time as a result of the fact that people don't have the confidence right now to go into the startup market? Yes, yeah, so I, th I think the value of having a strong startup ecosystem, I think that there's, there's, there are two aspects. I think the first is um, its blanket bomb as um, effect that it has on industry. So um, cities, because you obviously have to compare Malta to a city, so cities which have very strong startup ecosystem, um, ecosystems, they tend to have very strong sort of entrepreneurial 
um, drive in the way people approach business, even if you're an employee. Um, so having a strong um, startup ecosystem has a massive effect on talent, um, whether they're employed or actually building new businesses. I think that's the first thing because it, it's extremely broad. I think that the second is um, um, when you're looking at investing in a, in, a, in startups or a startup ecosystem, what you're doing is you're looking at a different horizon than um, you know investing in you know bringing established businesses into Malta. So if you're bringing an established business into Malta, who's going to employ you know 200 employees, that's an immediate uptick in 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 you know the number of people that are employed you know the the the, the effect on on on, on the industry etc cetera, etc cetera. whereas startups you're looking at a much um so a horizon which is which is significantly more uh you know further away um and you're also you know you're you're, you're building a base for for such businesses to be to be created um and success tends to attract success um and we've seen this you've seen this in every jurisdiction and we've also seen this in malta where you have you know, huge companies like like GFI, for example, um, who who grew at a significant pace, Malta's largest, uh, probably Malta's largest startup um, within the tech space. And out of that, you know, many other businesses came uh, were developed. Altaro, for example, being one of them. Um, you know, so so you know, you you start creating this this success, bringing in success, which is why it is so important um, to actually invest in this in this space. Fabulous. And, and to stay with you, do you see this affecting long term, whether startups continue to open? Uh, well, yes. Um, so um, the, the level of support that 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 Malta has offered during the crisis has not been high, particularly for um, businesses that are would be qualified as would be said to be they are, they're, they're of type startup um, where any profits that they make would reinvest, but we reinvested back into the business for growth. Um, they're fully investment uh, reliant. Um, so therefore, if, if there is a hit in, in, in their ability to either attract investment um, um, or generate a profit, then they immediately suffer. Um, loans um, just, just is not an, a, a, an option. Um, um, so, you know, when you look at, at, for example, what London did or what the UK did from an ecosystem where they focus more on the ecosystem rather than, you know, on, on solving very minor problems, um, that had a much better, better better effect. I think the challenge that we might see is, um, is startups succeeding because of the jurisdiction that they were in during COVID and the support that they managed to get um, um, during the crisis. Um, so rather than before, as we were before, where it was pretty flat, uh, it's a role level playing field. Um, you know, investors, the, the distance between the startup and the investor was starting to shrink. The distance between talent and the business was starting to shrink. And then it became extremely prominent once again. Um, so there might be this this um, distinction from a very much of a location-based um, stock distinction. So, Okay. Um, thanks for that, Simon. Tony, coming over to you to talk a little bit about the, the st startup space within the creative industries in Malta. I mean... I, I don't think I would be too far off the mark from saying that the majority of creative industry businesses in Malta are startups in a way. I think there are very few that have been around for a particularly long time. Does that make um, the sector even more vulnerable given um, the past few months? Um, yes and no. So I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is that we do kind of have this cultural resistance you now towards um, risk. Uh, so, you know, we're brought up with this culture of study to find a job. I remember, you know, when I used to study the arts or, or culture management, people just tell me, yeah, but um, what kind of job are you going to get? Uh, and we keep on getting this kind of mantra, no, the same thing uh, over. And the same thing happens for other sectors. So actually the, the, um, the culture to promote risk and innovation and, you know, um, and, and kicking off your own, your own enterprise is, is is not a widely accepted, so to speak, cultural phenomenon. So it's, we have to acknowledge that that's already the first challenge. You know, how do we get people to think of themselves as potential creative entrepreneurs, cultural entrepreneurs, or for the startup? And this even happens within our educational system. You know, um, I, I, I teach at university, and, and at times, you know, students tend to see this as an add-on. So we, we work on our business plan, and, we, and there's like this extra thing. And the first thing I tell every student when I walk into class is, 
remember that the majority of you will not apply for a job, but will create your own job, whether you like it or not. And now this is even more present than ever before. So the fact that we have these startups um, already kind of emerging somehow or you know, beyond their startup phase now, um, I think the first part, if we want to refer to a kind of recovery plan, is to make sure that these guys are able to grow. Actually, first thing before even growing is actually to survive and figure out where, where the gaps are uh, in, in, that, in that scenario. Um, the second thing is the probability that uh, a lot of jobs or companies are not looking at particular growth, especially in the creative sectors. The rate of uh, subcontracting may, may even increase. So this is also an opportunity in a way for someone to continue or to consider uh, a creative startup. Um, having said that, the environment is not the, the most diverse or, or in, in the if kind of, if we had to conduct a quick health check, as, as Simon was saying, perhaps even the appetite for, for risk on an individual point of view and also the culture that promotes that. Having said that, we do have organizations like, for example, Mort Enterprise that uh, recent, in recent years have been supporting a number of creative startups uh, in the process. And, and we start seeing a, a, a stronger push towards support. So in one way or another, starting up in the culture and creative industries is possible. But of course, it depends on business acumen, your plan, and also this kind of you know, innovative services you are going to create. If, if, you know, if you're going to do like everyone else is doing, then probability is that your the market is what it is. If you're not going to think internationally, if you're going to act internationally, then success starts dwindling very slowly. Of course. Um, Leander, we spoke briefly a little bit about how um, there's even been some successes for the startup world coming out of the past um, uh, few weeks. We, we've we seen in conversation with some of our other business leaders that this has been a great time for creativity, a great time for thinking, new beginnings, etc. cetera. Um, has that been your experience in conversation perhaps with other startups um, among your peers? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, it's something we speak about quite often. Um, obviously, we're always talking about how we are and where we where at, we're at with our startups. Um, and I found that um, the tech industry has boomed, um, rather than obviously Tony was saying the cultural industry. Um, mean, mainly because everything is online now. The, the 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 online world has advanced. It's it's boomed, especially locally. Um, everybody is going online. Um, everybody is doing something techy. Um, it is what it is. Um, and I think even other areas within the startup world, other industries, are even finding a way um, also to have a tech element or um, put themselves online um, to keep their startup um, growing. And developing. Yeah. And um, Leander, sort of staying with you, we, we've never been as online as we are now. I think we've sort of all seen a, a massive increase in, uh, in the usage of services online. Is this an opportunity there? I mean, um, you know, are, are tech startups thinking that there's even more opportunity perhaps than they thought there might have been before COVID? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and even, I mean, I, it doesn't even have to be a tech startup um, for there to be an opportunity there. You know, it's um, anybody can go online. Anybody can do can do anything online. Um, supermarkets are all now online. Um, it's it's a new it's a new world. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, Simon, sort of with that in mind, I mean, you know, as sort of a, a Maltese-based person, we've kind of always had this uh, sort of way of thinking that the work that we do is Malta-based. But obviously, I think COVID has given us a uh, an, an bit of insight into the fact that we can be as global as anybody else. Do you expect to see more global uh, enterprises or more globally thinking enterprises coming out of Malta in the next few months? Yeah, I think, yeah, so as in by, if you look at, at a lot of local businesses, um, I think what they've understood by COVID after they had the, the cash flow shock um, was that they need to change. 
and that they need to change transformatively throughout the business. So it's not just um, how they sell things, but they have to reevaluate their supply chain. They have to reevaluate, you know, their processes, how they manage their staff, how they manage the, the, to keep the culture and motivation alive, and 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 every single function has been impacted in, in some way. Um, and 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 those that have reevaluated it and 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 sort of brought the business have gone through this digital transformation process and brought the business up to something which is a bit more 2020 relevant um, have experienced many doors opening um, because all of a sudden now they're competing um, on a level playing field with anybody else um, that is online. So so if I'm selling um, you know clothes online from Malta and I was only selling through Malta via a a shop. Uh, a physical retail outlet, and now I'm selling online. I have the whole world I can sell to. Um, you know, so so all of a sudden, the opportunity from, oh no, my 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 physical shop is not doing well. To actually wait, my digital shop can actually do surpass the sales that that my my physical shop had, and start creating this new, um, you know, opportunities and 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 level playing field where the shop can operate in, which is extremely exciting, particularly for you know smaller businesses. Um, you know that that um, felt that they couldn't scale, and now have the opportunity to do so. Okay, yeah. and sort of sticking, uh, Simon, with you, and sort of thoughts on the future. If you were a policymaker right now, looking to support the startup sector, what sort of initiatives would you be putting in place? Yes, so it, it's it's. So I think the, the first thing is looking at startups as an ecosystem. Um, um, almost as an industry in its own liking, in, 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 in its own right. Um, so rather than you know saying okay, so what are the, the sort of the minor problems that startups have? Um, it's looking at it extremely more broadly and say okay, so um, what does the ecosystem need in Malta? Um, where is it doing extremely well and where is it lacking? Um, and just being extremely realistic and practical. Um, so it's I think the first thing is to be more concrete. Um, um, yes, you know the, 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 the many ideas, the many policies that all jurisdictions across Europe have come out with. A lot of them were extremely interesting. However, when you actually be practical in terms of how do you actually materialize these 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 policies or these um, benefits or opportunities that policymakers are putting forward, they're actually very difficult to capitalize upon. Um, so you, you know, if you're going to be using, for example. Um, you know the, the traditional banking um, infrastructure. You know banks have a very different way of looking at the world from a risk perspective. So if you're trying to push a, a policy through the existing banking system, there's going to be some friction over there, um, um, which is going to come out. So, so again, so how do you be a, little, a lot more practical um, when, when when dealing with startups? Um, so I think I think the first thing is practicality, and then the second thing is um, you know treating startups as an ecosystem um, rather than sort of breaking it down into smaller points. Um, you know, I think that is one of the two things I would go for. Absolutely. And Tony, how does that uh, differ from the creative industries? And in your opinion, if we did invest in the creative industries, if we did give them the support that they needed at startup phase, what could we look forward to as a creative se sector? No, I think I, I perfectly agree with Simon. I think the most important thing is that we we'll look at it as an ecology. And that is so again, it is useless putting in, um, you know, startup grants when your education system is not responding, when the other infrastructure, when physical spaces are not are not responding to this. So you're looking at uh, physical clustering, digital transformation support. Um, and and when Malta started measuring, looking at the creative economy, it's very interesting because there is a, a quite a crossover with the, with the digital world because, for example, software is part of the creative economy. Um, and what we know now is that we have kind of a huge discrepancy between subsectors like software, for example, and other areas in the performing arts. So although we still think of them as the creative economy. There are very, very different realities. Um, and I think you need to probably, uh, now that we've acknowledged the creative economy as part and parcel of our economic development, we now may want to start looking at the specific subsectors with attention because we can't put them all under one category. So the way you invest in design is very different to the way you would look at crafts, for example, or the way you would look at museums um, or cultural tourism. Um, so, so I think having this kind of knowledge and also evidence uh, is, is very, very important. 
Um, uh, another important point I would like to raise is the fact that the, pub, the, the, the role of the public sector, especially in the arts, is still understood as being a key player or the key player. But we, we can't forget that 77% of all the people who work in the sector work in the private industry. So ultimately, it's the private sector that keeps the culture and creative industries alive. So, and we tend to have at times this kind of conflicting messages even emerging from different policies. You get policies supporting startups and at the same time, you get the state that competes with startups by, for example, in organizing events. Um, so, you know, it's like the left hand doesn't always know what the right hand's doing. Um, and this is why, from a policy point of view, we constantly, constantly need this coherence because it's very easy to kind of go across different directions. Um, so from a public policy point of view, this is very, very important. Absolutely. And um, sort of staying with that thought process, Leander, what would you need in by way of support as an up and coming startup? Obviously, you need investment, but I'm sure that as somebody with a great idea that you want to bring to market, and I'm sure we have viewers today who are sort of thinking, oh, I've got a great idea and I'd like to take that to market. What is it that they that you need right now from our policymakers in order to make your goal a reality? Whew. It's a tough question. Um, there's a lot I'd love from them. <laughs> um, uh, going, I mean, going back to what Tony was saying, I mean, um, that there, there is an ecosystem to some degree in Malta of, of a start, having a startup and, and putting your idea out there. Um, but Malta, I think, um, I mean, I've lived here for 15 years and I've noticed that there's the, an entrepreneurship sort of um, going into being an entrepreneur and going into st creating a startup is not something that's really embraced, I think, even from a young age. Um, it's not something that's um, that they, they teach in school or they push in school. It's not something that's really, I mean, it's, you know, go to school, get your degree, um, get a job. Um, it's not something that I think is put, it's not in the syllabus at school. It's not something that kids are really told about. Um, and I think if if that was available and if that was something that um, they could introduce to the to the to to Malta, I think it would be a great um, a great island, a great place for startups um, because it could there could be a strong a strong ecosystem here um, simply because of its size and because it's a great test base. It's a great um, it's a great place to live. It's a, you know, it's there's a lot of factors that, and also there's a lot of industries here that are very saturated. You know, there's the, the real estate industry, the catering industry, construction. I mean, if if startups were to boom and were to blossom and were to flourish here in Malta, then it really would help create, I think, a stronger economy and as a whole, as well. Perfect. And, and Simon, sort of staying on that thought a little bit, I'd love to sort of give our viewers a bit of a picture of what a successful startup economy looks like for a country. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, obviously, there, there, are, there, are, there are many sort of success stories from, from a city perspective, um, you know, where, where you have, you know, ecosystems um, that have built this culture and, and now have, you know, this, this, this huge momentum behind it. Um, um, and 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 what happens is you know you you end up with you know this this um, uh, impact that is very very sort of transformational across multiple areas you know where you know so sort of the way governments start to operate is influenced um, so the way policy is is made the way your SMEs look at at technology um, and the way individuals look at at technology so it it, must, it, it tends to have um, quite an infiltrating uh, impact on 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 um, cities or countries. Um, I think to go back to, to what Leanna was saying, I think the, the whole world is going through a, a obviously a, a massive change, um, you know, and and much bigger than than two thousand and eight. I think the opportunity now for us to create um, an ecosystem and more still for us to capitalize on the way um, both businesses and human behavior has changed because of COVID um, has created this massive opportunity, this massive, massive vacuum. Um, you know, we're seeing new industries come up uh, constantly. 
Um, I mean, sex tech, for example, was always a thing. Now it's huge. I mean, the amount of money that is being thrown into it uh, because of the implications that COVID has had, which was, did not exist, um, you know, three, four years ago. Uh, so there's, there's, you know, education being another one. So there's, there's lots of these new um, models, these new you know, um, um, products coming out there. Um, and there is money there. Um, it's just how do you, um, you know, build the necessary bridges that you need to be able to capitalize upon them, as well as use the resources that you already have here from a talent perspective, from an infrastructure, um, you know, so so from a timing perspective, Malta's now is definitely the right time to start to make some solid, solid changes and, and look at the opportunities. Okay, um, so thank you, Simon. And sort of as we wrap up, I'd love to sort of just go to everybody in turn, starting with you, Sai, just to give your advice perhaps to anybody that is um, interested in uh, coming into the sector. We know that um, from the last crisis, 2008, some of the world's most successful organizations today actually came out of that crisis. So as you said, Simon, this could be the right time uh, for an organization if they are able to solve a problem um, uh, that is now um, in the world. So Simon, your advice to anybody that thinks they have a great idea. Yeah, so so um, I think there are there are two for, for two types of individuals. So for for individuals that already have a business as a going concern, um, you know, looking at this moment of time to say, how can I change my business to a make it digital and b make it lean. So how do I remove as much fat on my business as possible? Um, for people that say, you know, I've always wanted to do something, and I think that now because of COVID has made the, sort of the, the perfect time to do it. Um, the fact that they getting investment is hard really forces you to think um, um, about, you know, how can I get this to market in the leanest possible way? Um, um, and, and, you know, the opportunity is now, if, not, if you're not going to do it now, then when? Um, so I'd say it wouldn't, you know, scare people away from doing it at, at, at this point in time. Um, you know, there's a huge talent opportunity because a lot of people have been laid off. Um, so there's a huge talent opportunity and, and talent is now a lot more flexible. Um, there's new behaviors. Um, there's, there's, there's businesses that are interested in, in developing partnerships. So timing is, is ideal. Excellent. Thank you. Leander, your thoughts perhaps to your peers, anybody who might be thinking of joining you in the startup space? Um, well, I think what my advice would be to to anybody with an idea or anybody with a, even if it's just, they've just written it down on a piece of paper, I mean, just to, to go for it and to not be afraid um, and to ask for help uh, wherever, wherever necessary. There's a lot of um, organizations now that can help startups. Um, and I was one that went through one myself. I, I attended the Meta program and it really did help me. I met a lot of, um, people there that helped and guide me. Simon was one of them actually. Um, and I think I think that's the one thing I would I would I would give. I would say just don't be afraid and just to ask for help wherever wherever you need it and wherever possible. Perfect. Thank you, Leander. And finally Tony, your advice perhaps to any creative startups thinking is now the worst possible time to be doing this or should I go for it? Well for some it is. Um, some it is a difficult time and will remain a difficult time. You know, live arts need a live audience. We can talk about digital transformation as much as we want to, but so there is that challenge which we have to acknowledge and, and we have to acknowledge that there are people, you know, be, uh, they are unemployed as we speak. Um, so this is a huge reality which we have to, which have to acknowledge. On the other hand, there are other sectors where this is possibly an opportunity for growth and development. Um, so, and again, reaching out is, is super important. Just if I may just plug in something here. Um, as Culture Venture, we are now part of a global network of creative business startups, the Creative Business Network. And every year we will match, uh, we will, uh, the, the plan is to have a winner from Malta, the best creative business startup uh, to compete on a global level. It's like the global Olympics for startups. Um, so the idea is that we even create a community because as, as Simon and Leanne were talking, creating this ecology is very important. So, you know, you may be alone, you may feel that you're alone, but probably there is someone out there even right now in Malta thinking of something similar or going to the same experience. And I think it's very, very important. I mean, I, I've worked with people who have, you know, were just about to give up and then realized that, you know, there's, there's 
there are other people in the same situation. So what I'm trying to do is connect as much as possible people from advertising, design, crafts, film, performing arts, startups to actually come together and create a stronger community. Because if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't expect others to take care of us. Perfect. Well, thank you, Simon, Leander, and Tony, very much for that insight there. Some some great advice, both perhaps for um, startups, would-be startups, and perhaps even inv investors who might be thinking of uh, of the next big thing and perhaps a great project to come out of um, COVID-19. So thank you very much for being on the show. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. And to everyone watching us at home or at the office, great to have you with us again on The Boardroom, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Good afternoon.